good. So we we've been through the most spectacular uh, experiment in science communication in the in the history of humankind. Uh, the the pandemic, among uh, many other things, more dramatic, has been also an extraordinary opportunity for studying public perception of the role of science and scientific experts. There's been an extraordinary level of involvement of scientific experts in media coverage. We, we've never seen so many scientists on television, primetime television, interviewed by newspapers, social media. And more in general, we have witnessed and an incredible example of what uh, we call in the in the field of psycho research the mediatization of science, meaning uh, science becoming and this is, is a long term process which had started long time before the pandemic, but clearly uh, saw an acceleration and amplification during the pandemic. The mediatization of science, meaning uh, the world of science and research becoming more and more sensitive to the logic of uh, public communication and media communication or with, through all sorts of media and also becoming more active in communicating and engaging directly with the general public. Uh, of course, issues like uh, clarity and trust uh, are key in this, uh, in this context. And of course, the social media are making possible uh, for, for scientific experts through Twitter, Facebook, and other platforms to get in touch directly with, uh, with non-experts. Uh, we have seen this uh, all across the world, uh, visible scientists, uh, scientists and experts who became key figures, uh, visible familiar figures for um, general audiences, United States, the UK, Mexico, South Africa, some example, and here is a is a group of the many virologists, immunologists, uh, epidemiologists who became familiar faces to the Italian audience. Of course, irony and humor is always an interesting indicator of social perception. People started to make T-shirts of these visible scientists, started to make comics, caricature, and somebody in Italy had the idea that you can make a collection of figurines of virologists and immunologists, like, just like you do for football or soccer players. Um, during the, not just during the pandemic, more in general, uh, there has been, or there is, uh, very um, widespread discussion of three main aspects and concerns. The lack of trust in science and scientific expertise. I think this is this is a narrative that we hear very frequently, particularly by policymakers, uh, scientists in the life sciences and other fields. People don't trust science and scientific expertise. Then there is the issue of the so-called infodemic, fake news, especially in social media. Um, low quality information circulating and influencing people. And also a widespread stereotype that people uh, have been misguided, have, have been relying mostly on social media and being misguided, particularly during the pandemic. Now I'm going to show um, with our own research, but also several studies which have demonstrated that these stereotypes are actually stereotypes and they're not um, they're not confirmed at all actually they are largely challenged by the empirical evidence that we have in science communication and studies of science in society um, as you know Italy was the uh, first European country to be substantially hit by covid so, we, we were able to start research on public perception of COVID and uh, communication at, since the very start. Uh, Italian data were among the first to be collected together with Germany then and Sweden. Uh, nowadays, according to our government, 90% of the population has completed the primary vaccination cycle. 
However, in 2020, when there was still a discussion of the forthcoming vaccine, only 21% of Italians, uh, um, sorry, 21% of Italians did not plan to get vaccinated and, and 38 would rather not be among the first. Uh, also, Italy, according to the Eurobarometer, before the pandemic, at the second highest level of vaccine hesitancy in Europe. This is the general context in which we placed our research uh, on the public perception of COVID-19 vaccination, the role of trust and experts. Uh, I did this study with my colleagues, Eliana Fattorini from Trento and Barbara Saracino from Bologna, which I should like to acknowledge and thank. How did we do it? Uh, we, we did this in the context of the Science in Society Monitor, which is one of the longest series in Europe of uh, studies of public perception of science. It is a regular survey of public perception about uh, science-related issues on a representative sample of the Italian population by gender, age, and area of residence. Uh, done both through telephone and web interviewed. And of course, we were very interested in focusing on the role of trust in national scientific experts and other key actors in the evaluation of the experts' public communication that, as I mentioned, was so important, not just in Italy. I know from my discussion in Japan that it was a very similar situation and the use of information sources and judgment of the trustworthiness. So we were able to study this uh, all through the, the first two years, and then we also continued, but now I will focus on the first um, two years, 2020 and 2021 of the pandemic since October until May. Um, some of the key results for the attitudes towards anti-COVID-19 vaccine. In October 2020, 36% of Italians were willing to be vaccinated. This grew uh, when vaccine became available to 60%. And then in May 2021, it was already 84%. So, so already very high. Um, the main motivation was the perception that the benefits exceeded risk. The main concern in Italy, as in other countries, was that the procedure to approve the vaccine was too quick and, uh, and the hastily approval was a, was a point of concern for some uh, citizens. Let me come to the uh, key question of trust in science and scientists. As I said, there is a, a widespread narrative about people distrusting science in uh, many countries. Uh, but this is uh, actually uh, not warranted at any level by the data that we have. If we look at data uh, from the Science in Society Monitor, from the Eurobarometer, I will show you in a minute data from other countries. Trust in science is consistently high and has increased over the years, even independently of the pandemic, but also during and through the pandemic. These are the data from Germany, <clears throat> Wissenschaft in Dialog. Uh, two thirds of German trust completely or partially science. Pew Research Center, which is the main reference for United States, mostly positive effect of science or impact of science on society, very high uh, during the, the last five years. Uh, Sweden, Wetenskapoch Almanet, fairly and high confidence in research, uh, even 86%. So this is, uh, this is a very important point. And when we look more specifically about confidence in spe on specific categories, again, we see that scientists, this is during the pandemic in Italy, uh, 2021, uh, rank very, very highly on the top of the confidence and trustworthiness, together with uh, professionals who work in the health field, then national health authorities, international health authorities, 
Very lower is the trust and confidence in national political authorities, local political authorities, and journalism. And this is, this is of course, should be a matter of concern because we will see how the role of institution has been uh, important in shaping particularly the, the intention to, um, to uh, get vaccinated. Similar situation in Germany, doctors and medical staff and scientists, enormous different with other categories like journalists, public authority and politicians. And please notice also something which I will come back when I talk about social media, uh, very modest role of personal contacts like family members, acquaintances in uh, giving information about or, or trust in the statement by personal contacts about COVID pandemic. The US, again, very similar, medical scientists, scientists between 90 and 80%, much stronger than in other categories. Now, um, what about the stereotypes that people were an easy prey of misinformation? They were believing, they were relying on social media and believing everything they saw on Facebook or Instagram, on Twitter. These are the data from Germany. Uh, and we start seeing, and we will see it even more strongly with other data, that during the pandemic, people, uh, to some extent, interestingly, went back to traditional media for information. And this can have a, a number of explanations that we might um, maybe discuss in the, in the discussion. But the role of social media was not very strong. Um, these are the data about Italy. And again, television and radio news, news programs were the most widely consulted sources of information, then institutional sources, and only 4% relied on social media and web forums. Here you see the data in a, in a timeline, in a, in a time perspective. The role of TV and radio news was very, very strong in the first part of the pandemic that became a little bit less important. Institutional web sources like the health authorities, also quite significant. Uh, what became much more important, uh, particularly during the vaccination phase, was the role of the uh, medical doctors, people asking the medical doctors what they should do or what was going on. And the role of social media contacts uh, always between 4% or even less than uh, 6 uh, or 7%. So much more modest than, than what uh, we are induced to think by uh, the stereotype. So we divided in Italy, we identified four quadrants uh, of media use and perceived reliability. The sources which were uh, heavily used and considered uh, trustworthy, like institutional web sources and the general practitioner, your own medical doctor. Sources like television, which were widely used, but not so much, not considered particularly reliable. The daily press, which was somewhere in between, and social media, uh, not, not very much used and considered not reliable. Experts, as I mentioned, and as we all know from uh, uh, the experience of different countries, had a particularly visible role, uh, an active role during the pandemic. Um, virologists, immunologists, epidemiologists. Uh, here are the data from Germany. Um, the, the key point here is that the discussion among experts, the uh, polyphony of voices, uh, at some, particularly since, since a certain moment, uh, started to create. So in the first place, it was a, a welcoming contribution. But then 
in the long term, it started to create confusion. So about more than 50% of German citizens say, when scientists disagree about Corona, it's difficult for me to judge which information is correct. Even stronger in Italy, you see how it has grown during the different stages and waves of the pandemic. Uh, 62% uh, in the spring of 2021 perceived the uh, different opinions by Italian scientific experts as a source of confusion. Um, so when we come to the discussion of our data, it, there are a few points which are quite clear. First, that the specific vaccine hesitancy towards uh, anti-COVID vaccine, which as I said, it, it became smaller and smaller during time, doesn't come from generalized skepticism about vaccine or generalized distrust in science, but was for, related with specific concerns that could have been dispelled or challenged by appropriate of communication, appropriate institutional communication. Uh, the role of misinformation or uncareful exposure to, uh, for example, social media information should be critically reconsidered. And trust in scientific experts and perception of their communicative role during the pandemic was fundamental in understanding the willingness to get vaccinated. Uh, and this uh, played a role in three ways. Uh, in terms of scientists to be able to provide responses, in terms of evaluation of the experts' contribution, and in terms of communicative performance by the experts. Uh, let me come to my uh, conclusion. Uh, the, there are a key uh, lessons and key challenges for science communication in the um, in the pandemic situation. But as I said, uh, the pandemic amplified to a large extent trends like the trend of uh, mediatization of science, of scientists and research institutions becoming more and more active in public communication that had started a uh, long term ago. Uh, the unprecedented exposure of expert sources across the media found many of them and their institution unprepared to deal with such new responsibility. Uh, political and health institutions uh, need to invest in the long term uh, in effective science communication strategies. Another problem that we have seen, uh, I don't know whether also in Japan, but uh, certainly in Italy and many European countries, is that uh, institutions had an expectation that uh, science communication was like pu pushing a button in case of need. But of course, uh, you, cannot, you cannot build uh, in the short term a relationship of trust, uh, a relationship of trustful communication, uh, particularly during a crisis situation. So if you want to communicate in that situation, you have uh, you, you have, uh, should have built a trustful communication relation in times of peace, so to say. Uh, and so there, there needs to be a long-term investment by uh, a public institution in communication with the citizens to be ready uh, to uh, communicate and engage in trustful relationships in a, in a situation of crisis. There is a, um, a key point about developing science communication skills within institutions. Communication, as I said, science communication is moving more and more away from the traditional mediation of journalism uh, to a direct to consumer, so to say, model. And so we need uh, science communication skills inside uh, research organization and academic organizations. We need to share data and practices at the international level. In some countries, uh, institutions need very sophisticated. I'm thinking, for example, about the FDA in the United States, uh, very simple, accessible, yet sophisticated uh, explanation through videos, for example, of how the vaccine had been approved. And we need, of course, we need to know the stud, uh, the, to study comparatively 
how uh, science communication, high quality science communication, strongly relates to mutual trust among experts, citizens, and institutions. Uh, let me emphasize this point, and not just a question of citizen trusting um, the experts and the institution, it's also the other way around. If the experts believe that citizens are distrustful or ignorant or even stupid, there cannot be a, a mutual or a trustful uh, uh, communication relationship. And the same goes with the relationship between uh, citizens and institutions. So I think I will, I will stop here and I'm sure there will be questions and uh, comments, or if I can clarify some concepts, uh, I'd be happy to do so. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Ricky. I personally really wanted to welcome you as a keynote speaker this time because uh, I when since when I have found your paper. Uh, I cannot do, hear you. Oh, okay. Oh, do you hear us okay? Yeah. So. Do you hear me, Dr. Ricky? I think all the participants hear me okay. Do you hear me? Oh, Dr. Ricky. Hello. Hello, do you hear me? I think it's only Dr. Ricky's, uh, yeah. Slide. Do you hear me okay? Hello. So we welcome your questions in chat <clears throat> box in the meantime. Please uh, post your questions in the uh, chat box. We have about 15, I don't know, 15 minutes. Do you hear me okay, okay no, Dr. Yeah, Ricky? Yeah, ah, okay, yeah, uh, now, okay, thank okay. you. Okay, yes, okay. I personally really wanted to welcome you uh, to this uh, forum since when I, I found your paper, because I think the Japanese government uh, or Japan has a lot to learn from your study. So uh, we are now accepting the your questions. So first, uh, I'm curious about how your study has been started, initiated so early during the, <laughs> at the stage of the pandemic. Did, yeah. did you did you receive any requests from the government? No, not at all, unfortunately. But uh, we, uh, as I said, we uh, luckily we had we had the machine already already set because of the, our science in society monitor being going on for more than twenty years. So we, we had the methodological tool and uh, uh, Observa, the foundation which is running this monitor, invested quite a bit to, uh, to immediately start the study. Uh, and and uh, this is why we were able to start so quickly. We thought it was, it was an incredible occasion in a tragic situation to study public perception of science and science communication and the role of experts and we could give a contribution. Unfortunately, <clears throat> the uh, institutions were not, uh, we received a lot of interest uh, by the media and by the and by colleagues worldwide, but uh, institutions in Italy and in many other countries, they were not so receptive about the importance of studying uh, public audiences and their perception. And this is one of the problems because how can you do, uh, I come back to the point of uh, high quality science communication. How can you do good quality science communication if you don't know your audiences, right? Uh, as science communicators, you know this very well, but apparently this is not, this is not evident to policymakers, institutions, and visible scientists. Interesting. Okay, thank you very much. So next question um, is, if I understand correctly, uh, you mentioned that journalists had very low trust from the public and it decreased with COVID. Why do you think is that? And did you analyze journalists with different affiliations separately regarding trust? For example, Daily Mail, v VS, BBC News journalists? 
No, we don't. The, the, the answer to the second question is no. We, we, we have a question in general about journalists. Um, I think, I don't know how it is in Japan. I think in Italy, uh, or I would say also in Europe, there is a growing perception by citizens that uh, journalism is not, uh, how can I say, not, not necessary to some extent because information is so readily available uh, through the web and social media. But of course, we know that uh, this, is, uh, this is a dangerous perception because, mm, of course, the, the landscape of uh, media, uh, not just with regard to technology, has changed. But the need for high quality um, reporting or uh, high quality uh, presentation of scientific content, but also in general in other fields, is even more important now than it than it was. So we uh, we we live in 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 an in an age of an interesting paradox that uh, we're all complaining about the quality of information. You know the fake news and infodemic, which are labels that I don't like very much, as you understood. But uh, at the same time. Uh, people are not willing to pay for the quality of information, which of course it has a cost because it involves uh, well-prepared uh, professionals. So this, I think, even beyond science communication is a great theme of our time. How do, uh, how do we emphasize the importance of value of uh, high quality information? Yes. Um, is it okay? Um, Kaita? Uh, Katya, sorry, Katya, uh, who asked the question. Okay, so the next question is from Kami. Hi, Ms. Miano. Fascinating talk. Just wondering if your research has been able to explore strategies to navigate the polyphony, polyphony of opinions or voices from scientific experts. For instance, in the Philippines, where I come from, scientists associated with government institutions which sometimes espouse certain views. Meanwhile, their colleagues affiliated with academic institutions say otherwise. How can non-expert public know who to trust? And how can scientists maintain public trust in science in similarly confusing situation? I think this is really a critical point, and I've written uh, myself uh, in uh, on Italian newspapers, for example, about it uh, several times. Uh, I think it's, uh, of course, it's impossible and it's not desirable to mute any scientist who is willing to express their voice for a number of reasons, uh, particularly in uh, democratic societies. But I think uh, it should be. One point should be the distinction, uh, to make more clear the distinction between, as you say in the question, scientists who are expressing uh, a point or an advice in their capacity of official members of some institutional committee, for example, and scientists who are expressing the views independently, so to say, because they think they have something to say. So uh, this, this was not clear at all to citizens. So it was just, uh, uh, you, you know, this, uh, this, there is a, this effect in literature, which is called balancing. The media, particularly television, tend to like to just expose two voices who are saying different things and put it on the same level, you know, uh, whatever the uh, whatever the actual value of what the scientists are saying. So we saw a lot of this during the pandemic. So a scientist was saying A and another scientist was invited because he wanted to say B or he was available to say a different thing. And this of course was confusing, but as I said, my, it cannot be solved uh, finally, but the institutions could be make more, more clear that this is a scientist who is a head of the uh, advisory committee about the pandemic crisis. And this is a professor X from the university Y. 
who is saying certain things and they both have a place, but it's a different, it should be uh, more clear the difference in these, uh, in these roles. Okay, thank you. So one more question from uh, Khalib. While knowing the audience in science communication is critically important, how can a researcher find the best audience for their work to either advance their career or expand the reach of their message? I think uh, to know your audiences, to know what are their uh, attitudes, perceptions is a critical point for any communicator. And if scientists and their institution, they want to be more active and protagonists, as we know they are, because we know from studies that um, universities are investing a lot more than in the past in the public engagement with science. Uh, then they should invest as an element of quality. Quality of science communication is not just accuracy. Accuracy is one element, is one dimension of quality, but uh, high quality science communication includes an intelligence of your audiences. And um, otherwise we just rely on the stereotypes. And this is what we have seen all through the pandemic, right? Uh, improvised experts who thought that because they know a lot about immunology, they also know how to make science communication and we're basically improvising. And a lot of paternalism, you know, citizens cannot understand. So we just need to reassure them. We don't need to explain anything. So I would say <clears throat> this would be one of the first points uh, that uh, we as science communication scholars and you as communicators, we should emphasize with the institutions that uh, we cannot have a good quality science communication if we don't know uh, who we are talking with and what are their expectations, what is the existing level of knowledge, what are the concerns, um, how can we address the concerns about vaccines if we don't know what it is uh what types of concern it is so people were treated like uh, uh anti-vaccinationists while these were very very small portion there was instead it was a gray area of people who were genuinely worried about uh certain uh, problems that uh, their health condition may have when when they get vaccinated so this should be should have been the focus of the communication Okay, thank you very much. So one more question from Hitomi-san. Thank you for, uh, for sharing your work. It seems that the people trust the science, but are less so of the mot motives of other stakeholders. What can science communicators do to better equip themselves to navigate the cultural climates unique to each audience pool? Yeah, that's, that's a very good but difficult, difficult question. Um, as I said, um, knowing, for example, uh, looking at the data available from, uh, I know these data are available also from Japan, that's already a good starting point for, for science communicators. But uh, um, as I mentioned, I think we should, uh, as the citizens uh, and not just as science communicators, we should be uh, on the other hand, on the one hand, I mean, we should rejoice that scientists and, and science has a lot of trust, but we should be very concerned that journalists and politics uh, are so uh, uh, considered so distrustfully by citizens today, because how can, again, how can uh, we have good information if journalism is considered of no value? How can we have um, a consensus on, on certain policies, uh, like for example, but not just during the pandemic, but related with science and technology, if people distrust politics. Uh, so this is, uh, it's a very broad theme, of course, it's a theme for uh, political scientists, for politics, for, for citizens at large. But I think this is the, 
if trust in high trust in science is the is the good news or the half full uh, glass, as we say, then the other side of the coin, which I find very worrying, is uh, increasing distrust in information and politics. Not politicians, uh, politics in general. Yes, okay, thank you very much. So uh, knowing the audience is very important, uh, but how can we engage public better to communicate the potential risks such as COVID? I, I th think one of the key lessons, uh, and I hope it will be learned by uh, institution and policymakers, is that uh, um, dialogue with the citizens about science and health related issues, as I said, is not, is not something you can switch when you need it. I mean, you in Japan, as I understand from what I've read and what and the many conversations I had, Fukushima was another uh, marking point, right? Where institutions real suddenly realized they had a problem in communicating with the citizens. But again, <clears throat> you should uh, you should build uh, this communicative relationship in times of peace, so to say, because you cannot start it uh, from scratch. You cannot expect, uh, for example, health institutions in Italy. They had never <clears throat> made available materials on their websites intended for general citizens to understand uh, easily. How could they expect, people didn't, didn't even know the websites or the social media of these institutions. They started to know during the pandemic. So what I mean very practically is that you should build, and there are, there are good practices around the world, uh, in Sweden, for example, in the United States, in the UK, of how you build, uh, or how you get people used uh, to engage with your content in uh, uh, in times of peace, meaning in the long term, as a habit, and then of course, when there is a crisis, they will they will know you, they will know uh, that your institution and your experts are people they can trust, and they provide accessible, good quality information. But this, I think, this is probably uh, one of the major lessons that in terms of communication that we can learn from the pandemic, but we will see whether it will be implemented because sometimes, you know, when the crisis is over or it's thought to be over, then you, again, you forget it until the next, until the next time you need it. And probably in Japan, it was a little bit like this between Fukushima and, and COVID. I don't know, maybe you can, you can say whether this, this was the case. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, yes, so do you think we, as a science communicator, do we have to get together, like, or each institute has to be prepared? No, I think it's a, it's very important that you get together just like you are doing uh, today or in these days, because uh, it's very important that politics and um, research institutions recognize uh, that science communication is an expertise and is a profession, just like uh, immunology or virology, and it deserves uh, specific uh, skills and specific expertise. And unfortunately, uh, just to give you the example of Italy, we had a, an advisory committee during the pandemic of about 20 people, and there was not a single expert in communication or science communication. Now, this is, uh, this is I think, where uh, associations like yours uh, have a space for, for becoming uh, more active and uh, help the, the, the policymakers and the institution recognize the value of your activity and the importance of including it as one of the key expertise. So to answer your question, I think you need both. You need that each of you uh, engages uh, with, 
with the their own institution to to uh, develop this idea, but also uh, at the collective level to engage in a dialogue with policy making to be more recognized uh, as a uh, as a profession, as I said. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for this insightful talk. Do you have any? Okay, there, there's a comment from uh, Camille. Completely agree. Science communication should be recognized more as a field of professional practice. And yeah, thanks for your talk and JSF organizing this event. Thank you. Yes, so if you have any other questions, we still have uh, three more minutes if you would like to uh, ask. Uh, Dr. Buki, uh, questions. Oh, okay. Oh, from Letizia, a uh, com comment. Thank you for the talk. My feeling is that part of the problem is that the public and the politicians are not comfortable with uncertain uncertainty and the statistics. Would you agree? And what could we do about it? Uh, yes, obviously I agree, but. Um... This is in inevitable, I would say, to some extent, because uh, politicians, for example, they need to take decisions. And so it's, uh, it's very hard for them, understandably, to deal uh, with uh, experts who are saying, we don't know, quite honestly, you know? So uh, I think, uh, let me mention here, a, a, famous scientist, the Nobel laureate, Patrick Blaquette, uh, physicist, English physicist, he was heavily involved as an expert during the Second World War. And uh, he used to say that in this situation, it should be the experts who understand uh, political decision. And his advice to, uh, to scientists was, if you want to be an expert advisor to the government, you should offer advice that you would follow yourself if you were a politician. So uh, otherwise, it's you know it's better to remain a scientist and and not engage in that, which is a difficult task. But you cannot just keep the state of the art of your knowledge. You have to make one step forward in this situation and provide an advice, of course, on the basis of imperfect knowledge. That's inevitable. Mm -hmm that the politicians and citizens could could use and understand uh, even if it could change the next day. So uh, to, my answer to your question is yes, it is a problem. It is partly inevitable, but those scientists who want to, uh, who want to engage as public experts, they can do something about it. Okay, thank you very much. So from Tirina, it is interesting to see public perception of crisis such as COVID-19 vs. climate change. Both are equally important and urgent. Even though there's generally a vague idea of climate crisis by the public, I, I assume, why there's such a lack of urgency towards it? Uh, actually, I mean, we know from data in Europe and Italy that there's, uh, uh, by now, there is a very widespread uh, awareness of the gravity and urgency of climate change. 90% uh, plus of citizens recognize that this is a major problem. The problem that we see, we have new data <clears throat> that will be published soon about this. The problem is how to translate this awareness into uh, practical behavior. Uh, for example, in terms of mobility, you know, uh, people who say, yes, we, we have a problem with climate change and so on, but they wouldn't change the, for example, the using of private uh, transport um, because uh, sometimes because uh, there are no alternatives, and sometimes simply because it's it's more, uh, easy or it's uh, more comfortable. So the key in, in the case of climate, uh, uh, the, the real gap is, is not a question of understanding and perception. It, it's how to translate these into practical actions at the individual level. Uh, 
Uh, and this is, uh, I think there's still a major gap. And it's very, it's not very easy to see how it can be filled. Uh, of course, uh, institutions, again, can do something about it. But uh, it is also a question of changing habits, which we know for, for uh, people is not the easiest thing to do. Mm. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Bucky. It is time, unfortunately, but we still received a, a question. So if you have time, please yeah, respond sure, to sure. him or her uh, in the chat box, please. And yeah. uh, yes, and thank you very much for your insightful talk. And I think everybody uh, received a very um, good inspiration. Uh, thank you very much.